So far in this unit of evolution and diversity, we've talked about natural selection and how populations evolve. We've talked about how species can come about. And we've um, focused, you know, kind of on the progression or the evolution of um, life, starting with uh, the microbes, going on to fungus and plants. And now we're going to talk about the evolution of animals. So we have to start out and see, okay, what is an animal? So an animal is eukaryotic, multicellular, heterotrophic organism. So it's made of eukaryotic cells. There's tons of cells in the actual organism itself, and it's heterotrophic, which means that it has to consume other things in order to get energy and survive. Most animals are going to be having uh, muscles for movement and nerve cells and um, depending on the complexity, uh, perhaps a brain or a bundle of nerve cells that control these muscles for movement and eating and digesting and um, just basic survival. Uh, animals are also uh, diploid in nature um, with their chromosomes. They've got two sets of chromosomes, one from you know the mother organism and one from the father organism. And um, animals are going to be solely reproducing sexually, you know, unlike um, some plants and some um, protists and bacteria that can reproduce asexually, animals per reproduce um, sexually. All right, so scientists have thought that um, and hypothesized that animals have evolved from colonial flagellated protists, which uh, we've talked about er in earlier lectures. And so um, we first get, you know, the first kind of animal looking organism about uh, 550 to 575 million years ago in the fossil record. And so that's when they believe the first animal type organisms have, uh, you know, started to, to come about on scene here on Earth. And that's um, basically what we call the Cambrian period. So um, we have a, you know, in that fossil record of the Cambrian period, we've got, um, you know, kind of a, a booming of early animal life. And the first animal species that we're actually going to focus on in this um, lecture are the sponges. The sponges are multicellular, so they have a bunch of different cells in the organism itself. Um, they are stationary animals, so they are actually not going to move around in their environment. They are going to um, stay um, where they're at. They are all marine. Um, so they're living in the water and um, sponges are, you know, very simple. Okay. They've got no nerve cells. They've got no muscles. The cells that they do have that are, um, you know, kind of making them up are unspecialized cells. So they're kind of like, you know, all, you know, the, either one of two types, which we'll talk about in just a sec. So um, they're not, you know, uh, they don't have cells that are really focused for, specific tasks. So, you know, if you think about us humans, we've got um, nerve cells to control our muscles. We have muscle cells to control um, our movements. We have, you know, digestive cells to break down our foods. Sponges don't. They have one of two kinds of cells and these cells are all together, but they're kind of random. Um, and they can react to their environment and they, you know, obviously help each other out in survival. Uh, but there's, you know, not really any specialization there. Now, the two kinds of cells that are in sponges are kyanocytes, um, which are the, the cells that are going to be drawing water um, kind of through the pores of a sponge. Um, and as it draws water, it brings in nutrients and um, kind of traps the nutrients within uh, itself. And the water then flows out through a bigger opening in the sponge. So if we take a look at the picture on the right, we're going to have, um, you know, the sponge is cells and in between the cells are little, little pores. And so water flows in this way and then out a bigger opening, you know, near the top. So if you look, you know, down here, that's this up here on top is that bigger outflow. And then um, all these little pores that you see is where water goes in. So these kyanocytes are um, trapping nutrients as water flows through the sponges. Now, um, amoebocytes are the second kind of cell that we find in sponges, and they are actually going to be the ones that are going to carry the nutrients from the kyanocytes. They're going to di digest these little nutrients and spread it, you know, to different other cells in the the sponge. So, 
in digestive purposes, you can think of uh, the amoebocytes as the digestive cells of a sponge, but they're going to um, basically kind of be moving around in the sponge and delivering nutrients to all the different kinds of cells. So that's basically what, you know, sponges are, um, the, you know, the very simplest kinds of animal invertebrates that we're going to talk about in this lecture. Next up on our evolutionary branch of um, animals is the nadarians. And um, these are the, you know, first animals where we actually have presence of body tissue. So there's not just, you know, a random set of cells in an organism, but there's actual tissues working together to do specific tasks. Now in Nadarians, we've got um, what's called radial symmetry, which means that if you cut, you know, the, the organism, you know, in half, it's kind of, you know, it's, it, you'll have mirror images no matter which way you cut it. Okay. So you know, this side's a mirror image of this side, this side's a mirror image of this side. That's what we say um, when we're talking about radial symmetry. Um, Nadarians are going to have tentacles with little stinging cells to help capture their prey. And um, basically, besides the stinging cells, they are um, just little sacs, in essence. Um, they're just kind of, you know, sacs with, that are, have digested juices in them in order to um, digest and break down the nutrients from their prey. Um, now, they do have within their sacs um, you know, a little some nerve cells to kind of guide and um, control their movements. And, um, but basically they're, they've got, you know, this big digestive compartment called the gastrovascular cavity, okay, which is in them. And um, nadarians are, you know, like we see here, jellyfish and sea anemones, corals, um, those kind of animals. And so they actually come in two different varieties. We can have polyp um, nadarians, which are stationary. They aren't going to move. So they're going to be like sponges. They're going to fix themselves on a rock or um, something like that. And um, they're not going to move. They're just going to kind of, you know, use their tentacles to grab what's ever floating by and bring them into their mouth for digestion. Okay. Um, now, what goes in the mouth also comes out the mouth. So the mouth that one hole is the mouth and the anus. Okay. So it's kind of weird to think about, but, um, whatever comes in that hole also goes out that hole. They don't have another hole, um, that food and nutrients pass through. Or you could also have what's called a medusa. Okay. Which is a moving nadarian like the jellies. Um, so they are kind of, you know, inverted from the polyps. So, um, they're, you know, they, look like little sacks with long little tentacles and they're going to um, sting and capture their prey and bring them up into their mouth again the mouth and anus are the same hole so they'll bring it up um, digest the you know the prey and then whatever nutrients they don't need just flushes right back out that same hole so those are the nadarians um, the second on our branch of evolutionary animals Next on our path to greater and greater uh, diversification and complexity of animals are the mollusks. Now the mollusks are soft bodied um, and most of them do have a protective hard shell. And so when we um, talk about mollusks, we can, um, there's actually three major groups. There's gastropods, which are um, snails and slugs. Uh, we've got bivalves, um, which are the clams and the oysters and the mussels that we have um, in the marine life. And then we've got cephalopods, which are octopus and squid. Okay, so there's three major groups of mollusks. And most of them have um, either, you know, like this hard protective shell um, that, you know, protects them and gives the, their body some strength and, um, you know, fighting off predators. So the mollusks have a three-part body plan. They've got a muscular foot for movement. Okay, so um, they're going to have these muscles that are going to help them move around in their environment. They've got a visceral mass kind of on the inside um, for, you know, where all their internal organs are. Um, you know, their small little brain um, with all the nerve cells coming out from it to control the muscles as well as um, their digestive uh, tissues. And then they also have what's called a mantle and the mantle is going to secrete the shell that they would have. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of 
um, you know, where that is. So these are the mollusks. Um, some can live on land, and a lot of them do live in um, the sea life, in the marine. Flatworms is next on our list, and these guys are the simplest animals with what's called bilateral symmetry. So bilateral symmetry means that you have to cut them lengthwise in order to find a mirror image. Um, of each other. So if you try to cut this guy this way, it's not going to be a mirror image. So um, bilateral symmetry means uh, you just have two sides that are mirror images of each other. You can't be cut in all kinds of different ways to have um, you know, symmetry. Um, now flatworms are going to have a muscular tube that's going to project out from their mouth to kind of help them suck in food. Um, so in this kind of flatworm down here, that's their muscular tube right there. Um, and these guys are going to have kind of the first, uh, you know, organized and very complex gastrovascular cavity that is highly branched, uh, meaning that it's not just um, a small tube that runs down their body, but it is uh, a very big branching tube that kind of reaches almost all of the cells in the body. Okay, so it's very branched, and you can see that in this picture here um, with all of the, you know, branches coming off. Um, the digestive tract. And so that's going to help again with um, all of the cells getting the absorption that they need. Now these flatworms include parasites, fun, like uh, blood flukes, which get into your um, get into your body and basically suck the blood out of your uh, out of your veins and arteries. And um, then we got tapeworms as well, okay, which um, are can infest uh, the digestive tract of other animals and um, feed off of, you know, whatever that animal eats. So um, these guys may look cool, but they are not fun if you get them inside of you. All right, we got yet another type of worm, okay, that is going to be um, slightly different than those flatworms. Uh, annelids is the next type of animal that we're going to talk about. Uh, these worms have body segments, so they're they're what we call segmented worms, and you can see the body segments. They look like you know they they're chopped up into um, you know little coils. It looks like as you go down their body. Um, these guys are going to have a complete digestive tract with a mouth and an anus end. Okay, so we have a mouth end and an anus end now, just not just one. Um, not just one hole for both purposes. So we have a one-way flow of nutrients down the body and out. Um, and these guys are the first to have what's called a true coelom. Okay, that's this word here. Um, coelom, which is uh, basically your body cavity lined with mesoderm. And mesoderm is a the middle layer of cells that develops as, um, it, you know, as a fetus, okay, or at that point is called a, a gastrula. So um, the mesoderm is basically the, the middle cell layer of um, an early embryo. And in all animals from annelids up, we're going to have the digestive tract being made out of that mesoderm, those mesoderm cells. So annelids are going to include your earthworms, okay, your standard earthworms. If you dig on a, you know, wet morning, in the soil, you can find a bunch of earthworms. And then um, there's also marine types as well, called polychaetes, and leeches. Good old leeches, like this guy down here, blood suckers. Okay. These guys are annelids. Um, they've got a you know mouth that kind of attaches to an organism, you know, another animal, and sucks the blood from them. Yes, people, one more round of worms. Okay, because um, these guys are different types of worms than the other two. Okay, so we had the flatworms, we had the annelids, and now we've got round worms, um, which are also called nematodes. So um, those are used interchangeably. These guys have a cylindrical body, um, and they are tapered at both ends, meaning they're kind of pointy at both ends. Um, these guys are going to be important decomposers. Um, so they're going to, you know, feed off of uh, dead you know, organisms and plant animal plant materials um, in order to recycle nutrients back into the soil. Uh, but these guys can also be parasites. In fact, um, you know, if you've got a dog or whatever, 
and um, it's had worms. It's most likely these round worms that get inside. In fact, here's a nasty picture for y'all of a round worm, a really bad round worm infection inside of intestines. So yes, this is the intestines and check out all of those hundreds, probably even thousands of round worms that are just inside feeding off of the food that's going through and uh, ugh, it's gross. Anyways, those are round worms. All right, the next animal to be featured on our evolutionary timeline is the arthropods. Okay, so these guys are animals um, that ha that are segmented. So they've got different kind of segments and different specific areas of their body. Um, and they've got jointed appendages. Okay, so they've got, you know, they're, they're not just one kind of stick hanging out there. They're a bunch of sticks, you know, connected together. Um, to make joints. And these, um, they are segmented and the segments are specialized and not repeated like we saw in the annelids. Um, these segments are specialized, so they're usually going to have a, you know, a head segment that's going to house the little brain and the mouth. Um, and then we've got the body segment for all the digestion and we've got, um, you know, the legs as a different segment for movement. Um, in arthropods, the body is covered in an exoskeleton made of protein and a polysaccharide called chitin. And this exoskeleton is going to protect and provide points of attachment for muscles. So just think about your bones being on the outside of your body instead of on the inside of your body. Um, serves, you know, kind of the same types of purposes for uh, points of attachment for muscles and for protection. Now the arthropods include um, several different kind of um, classes underneath. We've got arachnids, which are the spiders. Okay, there's they're um, going to have you know eight legs, right, and you know specialized little um, mouth appendages for for uh, you know what's it called? Uh, anesthetizing their prey and, and taking it into their mouth. Um, and uh, so yeah, so those those are the arachnids. Then we've got the crustaceans, which are marine arthropods, the crabs and the lobsters. Um, they've got you know pinchers to kind of you know, capture prey, as well as um, other legs for uh, moving around their environment. And then we've got the millipedes and the centipedes. Okay, the millipedes are going to have two legs per segment of their body, and the centipedes only have one pair of legs. Um, per segment of their body. Um, so the millipedes have, you know, double the legs as centipedes, um, but they're considered arthropods. And the last but not least, the, the biggest kind of class of arthropods are the insects. So any insect you can think of, um, with, you know, with wings, without wings, all right, is going to be um, classified in the phylum of arthropods. All right, the last type of animal that we're going to talk about in the invertebrate kind of section is the echinoderms, the lovely sea stars. Um, these guys are going to have spiny surfaces, and um, they're going to lack body segments like we saw in the um, arthropods. But they do, kind of going back to the nadarians, have this radial symmetry. So you can cut them in half and kind of get um, you know, a mirror image on both sides. Um, now they have an endoskeleton that is just beneath the skin. So it's not an exoskeleton like arthropods. It is a skeleton that, that lies right underneath the quote unquote skin of the animal. And um, they've also got a water vascular system that helps circulate water throughout their body for um, gas exchange and waste disposal. So if you think about you know our blood being for gas exchange and waste disposal for our cells, um, echinoderms don't have blood, they just do that same, um, that same function with water. So they're going to um, take in water um, and circulate it around their body and, and um, release that water as well um, to release all of the waste. So those are the echinoderms and they're all marine animals. So we've been talking about the simplest invertebrate animals um, of this world. Now we're going to transition to what's called the vertebrate. Um, and uh, the 
the phylum for those is what we call a chordate. So chordates are going to share four key features that are found you know, always in the embryo and sometimes those features get you know, transferred to the adult as well, um, but a lot of times we don't see them in the adult as just the embryo developing stages. So these four key features are uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord. So we've got this, you know, dorsal meaning on the backside, hollow meaning it's, you know, a hole, and nerve cord meaning that it houses the nerves that go to muscles and, um, for movement and or digestion. Then we've got a notochord, okay, which is um, a rod you know, of, you know, cells that run between the digestive tract and the nerve cord. And then um, there's what we call pharyngeal slits, or what some people like to think of as gills. And the last but not least, a post-anal tail. Okay, so all of the animals that we haven't talked about so far that don't fit in any of the invertebrate um, phylum are going to be in this chordate. So this is, you know, everything from, <clears throat> excuse me, fish to humans. Okay, so I guess we all share these four key features. And you can see, you know, that fish are going to still have those pharyngeal, pharyngeal slits or gills um, in the adult form, whereas us humans, we don't have gills in the adult form or even in the baby form. It's just in the very early stages of embryo development. All right. Um, all chordates are also going to have uh, body segments and segmented muscles. Okay. I Meaning not one just bl big blob of muscle like the foot muscle and the mollusks. Okay. But we're going to have specific muscles for specific movements. And then last but not least, those chordates um, are going to include some invertebrates, okay, which are called, um, you know, three different varieties, tunicates, lancets, and hagfish, versus the vertebrates, the guys with the backbones, um, uh, which, you know, which are all the animals that possess a backbone of some kind. So we're going to start out by talking about the simplest vertebrates or chordates, which are fish. And the earliest fish were jawless fish. So they didn't have like jaws um, per se, you know, it, structured in their mouth. Um, it was just kind of a hole. Like if we think about the, uh, the flatworms and the, the other roundworms and annelids had. Um, these earliest fish, the only two that still have survived are the hagfish and the lampreys. And uh, we've got a picture of a hagfish right up here. Um, that's what a hagfish looks like. Um, now all other fish are going to have jaws, okay, for their for their mouth. Um, and so there's basically two broad um, categories of fish. We can have cartilaginous fish, which include the sharks and the rays. Um, sharks and rays are going to have what is called a lateral line system of internal organs, which means that um, their internal organs are going to extend on both sides of their body, um, kind of, you know, on the lateral meaning side, and then um, a line kind of like on the line right there. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird to think about, but all of their internal organs kind of go on the, si on the sides of their body all the way down. Um, and they don't have an, um, what's called an operculum, okay? An operculum is this little flap over their gills that can move um, to uh, push water past their gills for oxygen um, exchange. So sharks and rays constantly have to swim if they want to breathe, in essence, um, because they have to keep moving if they want, uh, you know, water to pass over their gills so they can get oxygen because um, the gills are kind of like the lungs, in essence, um, where uh, that's where gas exchange of um, oxygen from the water and carbon dioxide from their cells is going to take place. Now, bony fish, okay, like trout and other bony fish you can think of, um, also have a lateral line system um, of organs, and they these guys do have an operculum. So if you, you know, looked at a fish and you can, you know, see the little things, you know, kind of moving back and forth across their gills. That's what we call the operculum. Um, so 
bony fish can actually kind of stand still in water and still breathe, um, whereas sharks and rays have to keep moving in order to breathe. Bony fish are also going to have what's called a swim bladder. Okay, it's basically kind of this um, hollow organ inside of them that they can fill with air, okay, in order to become more buoyant or, um, you know, deflate to kind of sink. And so, um, so that's kind of unique to bony fish as well. Cartilaginous fish, sharks and rays don't have that. So if the shark stops moving, if the shark stops swimming, it will sink because of gravity. Okay, so, um, but the bony fish can, you know, stop moving, still breathe, and stay at the same level with its swim bladder. So there's two major types of bony fish. Um, we call ray finned and lobed finned. Ray fin just means um, their fins are going to have like these skeletal rays um, of, you know, kind of cartil kind of cartilage, kind of bony, but it's very thin um, in their, you know, in their um, fins. But lobe fish kind of have this thicker bone type stuff supporting their, their fins. Okay, so that's kind of the two, two types of bony fish. All right, next up we're going to talk about the amphibians. Okay, so fish are strictly marine. You can't have a fish survive on land. But um, amphibians are kind of tied to both land and water. Um, they are uh, aquatic and terrestrial. They have aquatic and terrestrial um, adaptations. So their eggs and their young, their larva kind of um, stage of their life cycle are tied to the water. And the adults um, have adaptations that, you know, help them to survive on land. Um, but they're still going to need water in a moist environment to help with their lung function and gas exchange. Um, because although they do have lungs, um, they get, you know, the most efficient gas exchange um, also when their skin it, which is, you know, kind of very moist and porous, is um, aiding in the gas exchange as well. So these guys are um, amphibians. They can live in both water and, uh, and on land. Now reptiles um, are going to resemble amphibians, um, you know, in a sense. Uh, but these guys, um, instead of having like, nice, smooth, moist skin, they're going to have scaled, waterproof, kind of tough skin, okay? And they get they have um, what's called an amniotic egg that has a shell. Okay, so they lay eggs with shells, and it's an amniotic egg, meaning that um, everything that the embryo needs is in you know for survival and growth and and all the energy and stuff like that is housed inside of the egg. Um, so it's got all of the protein, carbohydrates, and stuff like that that the animal um, the embryo will need in order to grow and develop. Reptiles can, you know, live in water, but is not necessary um, for a lot of them too. Um, you know, in the same way as amphibians. So, you know, they don't have to rely on water in order to live. Obviously, they need water to survive. Um, you know, it's just like we need water, you know, to drink water to survive and stuff like that for body function. But um, they don't need it in the same way as amphibians. So, reptiles is actually a very huge. Um, phylum of animals it includes the ectotherms okay so ectotherms are animals that are what we call cold-blooded they don't use a, a bunch of you know body energy in order to regulate their body temperature okay so that's what we call ectotherms so snakes lizards turtles crocodiles these guys are ectotherms so um, if they get too hot they're going to need to find some shade in order to cool themselves down they can't you know sweat or anything like that in order to um, you know, cool themselves down. Same if it's too cold, they're going to need to find someplace warm in order to, um, to go in order, you know, in order to survive and not get too cold and die. So those are ectotherms. And then we've got endotherms, um, reptilia, reptilian endotherms are, um, the birds. Now the birds used to have their own phylum called the aves. Um, but apparently thanks to genetics, they've been clumped with the reptiles uh, because they've got a lot in common with their genes. Um, these guys are endotherms, which means that they use um, part of their metabolism, okay, part of their body energy in order to keep themselves warm or cool themselves off. So that's what we call endotherms. So birds um, now these days are actually part of the reptile phylum. 
Actually, I should say class, not phylum. All right, we are almost getting at the top or the most complex of animals. Um, and this includes the mammals. Okay, and so mammals are mostly terrestrial, though there are a few species that are, um, you know, still marine. And they've got two unique characteristics that are different from all other classes of animals. Um, this is the mammary glands, which the word mammal comes from, um, in which they, you know, feed their young through mammary glands that make milk and nutrients for the young. And they also have hair, okay, whether it's a lot of hair or a little hair, they at least have hair. Okay, instead of feathers or scales. Um, there's three major groups of mammals. We have the monotremes, which are the platy which is you know like the platypus. Um, and they are the ones that can be marine. And then um, the monotremes are going to still lay eggs, so they're not going to um, develop their, their young inside themselves. They're going to lay eggs still. Okay, and then we've got um, the second major group, which is the marsupials, like the kangaroos, koalas, and possums. And um, marsupials have pouches in which um, they develop their young. So development in a marsupial begins on the inside um, of the mom, and then uh, you know, early on in development, the, the little embryo is going to actually come out and... Um, make its way into the pouch for further development. It's going to, there's like a little nipple in the pouch and it can um, attach to that little nipple and, and suck in the nutrients it needs to, in order to grow and develop into a, you know, kind of full size young. And then we've got the eutherians, which are the dogs, cows, rodents, primates, and these guys are the placental animals. Um, so they've got placentas, their young are going to are going to develop fully inside of the mother um, and then come out um, you know, through the vagina um, like f as a fully developed uh, young. So they, the whole development happens inside of the mom in what's called a placenta. Okay, so part of the um, mammal class are the primates. Okay, and so the primates are kind of the higher order mammals. Um, and primates include everything from the lemurs to humans. And uh, kind of what makes primates special from the other animals is that usually they uh, mostly have single births. So they just have one child per birth. Um, obviously, you know, they can have twins and triplets and stuff like that. But we're not talking, you know, litters of puppies and litters of, of cats. Um, so they usually have uh, single births and they're going to nurture their offspring for a very long time. Okay, if you think of us humans, we nurture our offspring for about 18 to 24 years usually. Um, so that is a very long time uh, compared to other animals. So the primates, like I said, include the lemurs, monkeys, gibbons, orangutan, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. And, um, you know, DNA similarities between the two suggest that they perhaps um, have evolved from each other, from, you know, lemurs kind of evolving to um, the monkeys then to the gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. So, you know, that's why they always say the chimpanzees are, are the humans' closest cousins, um, genetically and evolutionary, evolutionarily. Okay, so um, and those are the primates. And we're going to stop there because um, that's kind of the higher, highest order of animals that we're going to talk about in the evolution of the animal species.